Hey everyone, back again. We're going to continue on with the punitive society here, but before jumping into it, you know the regular spiel. If you're just tuning into this, be sure to go check out part one. Go check out the previous episodes I've done on the lectures on the will to know and penal theories and institutions, which were the two previous sets of lectures from uh, Michel Foucault's time at the Collège de France. Uh, go check out however many other episodes I've done on Foucault. I don't know how many. Uh, a few if you like what i do like share subscribe tell your friends you can help me out monetarily via patreon or paypal follow me in other places links for all such things in the descriptions so yeah don't waste any more of your time with that stuff let's start with chapter four here and i'm going to cover chapters four five and six from this series of lectures here so in 1791 uh a man by the name of le peltier de saint felgeron or uh, felgeron Sorry, Faljo. I don't know why I did that. Le Pelletier de saint Faljo uh, argued that because the criminal is a social enemy, as we established in the last episode, they must be exiled or killed. And Robespierre thought that this was evil. Like, not, not everyone was on board with this, even though there was um, a broad movement to understand and grapple with criminals as being threats to the social body and to the livelihood of everybody within that social body. So many didn't think that this necessitated them being exiled or killed. Instead, there were efforts to try and provide more quote-unquote humane ways to deal with these people. But the extremity of these types of uh, efforts to deal with criminals really reveals how prominent these discussions were and how polarized people were about it, but really how scary it was that this transforming idea of the criminal or of somebody who'd done something wrong suddenly becoming this type of criminal could be treated like this. It really demands an examination of the conditions by which somebody could claim that a criminal was worthy of being put to death or exiled. But what does it really mean to appear as a social enemy. And this is something that I've noticed a lot, uh, and to my <laughs> my chagrin, to my embarrassment, I happen to listen to a fair amount of crime podcasts, or a fair number of crime podcasts. And one of the things that consistently happens in crime podcasts is one of the hosts or the hosts themselves will talk about mugshots and talk about the way that the convicted killer looks. And they'll often say something like, oh, you would have never known looking at them. And this opens up a whole series of possible questions. What does it mean to look like a criminal? Is it because this person was dressed in a suit that they didn't look like they could be a murderer, for example? You know, were they not covered in tattoos? You know, you don't really know what they mean when they say this. It's one of those things like you don't know what it is until, uh, except, you know, you don't know what it is until you've seen it. You just know it when you, I don't know why I messed that up. You, you only know it when you see it. You know what a social enemy is. You know what a criminal looks like just by looking at them. But this demands that we interrogate all of these conditions, all of the necessary situations that align certain presentations or certain uh, elements of self-presentation that are connected with this idea of criminality, which isn't a natural connection. It's, it's socially constructed, of course, and it's one that comes to be enforced through the repeated persecution and prosecution of these people and associating these identity markers with that prosecution or with that persecution. And it's just a good exercise. If you listen to crime podcasts or watch crime shows and you hear that anyone say like, oh, you wouldn't have expected it. Ask yourself, why? Why, why wouldn't uh, anyone have expected it? Why, what makes someone, how do you expect someone by virtue of the way that they present themselves to be a criminal? But in any case, is there any coincidence though that at this time in France, really in the late 18th century, leading into the early 19th century, that we saw prisons emerge as a standardized form of punishment for criminals. It's like we said last time, there were many other forms of punishment before this, and even 
that would extend beyond this uh, or during this time that would continue, like torturing someone, like putting someone to death in public, like exiling someone. The prison was not uh, a universal way to treat people or way to deal with criminals. So what happened at this period to make it so that prisons became the standardized measure, the standardized treatment of criminals? Well, there are so many different possible explanations here, and they could all be correct, and they could all contribute to it. Because at the time, we can't forget as well, that there was this emerging idea of the rights of humans, having basic liberties, having basic rights. And the prison being something that took somebody away from those rights so that they would be confined was a way by which to demonstrate that the state stands above even those very rights that it claims to hold sacred. And it can say, it can determine in what instances it will take those rights away, which is a very clever way to enforce the state's power and to enforce the state's superiority in more in the imposition or the decision of moral judgment to be able to say i can make this decision because i am superior or i am the correct one or whatever so it's really important to stress that it's not as though there's this very neat connection between the emergence of an idea of the idea of a social enemy and the emergence of prisons they're, they do share some connections insofar as they both emerged from other uh, other phenomena gave gave rise to them but they do not they they do not uh, motivate the emergence of one another they are the products of other things other phenomena that we'll get into in more detail because at first prison wasn't a punishment at all really it was a way to secure someone before they had to go to trial so make sure they wouldn't run away but it was still nevertheless something that was used. When it became the standard for treating criminals, then uh, it took on a completely new form. It was the perfection of the way that power was organized because it became homogenous. It allowed for a complete surveillance of its population that the social body was trying to implement as well to have better control over its citizens to make sure that they wouldn't break ranks they wouldn't uh, transgress those social bonds and rules so to take a step back and think about penality and think about punishment at this time late 18th century france the, uh, foucault identifies that there were four guiding kind of unconscious unwritten principles of punishment the first was that the harm inflicted by the criminal to society would have to uh, be mirrored in the punishment of that person. Now this would be determined proportionally to the amount of harm inflicted by the criminal onto society and then this would be used to calculate how much punishment to inflict on the citizen. So Foucault suggests that in a society that has grown very large in which a criminal's actions don't actually constitute a huge attack against society itself proportionally to the size of the society Chances are they wouldn't need to be punished greatly. But if the society was still in its infancy, any attack against the social body would, would probably be pretty significant. And so the demand for punishment and the punishment itself would be significant in proportional to that uh, initial harm done. The second unconscious guiding principle behind punishment was to make sure criminals wouldn't recommit crimes. Punishment was seen as a deterrent. If you punish someone, they would then be uh, hesitant to recommit a crime out of fear of being punished again. It was also used as an example for other people. The penal system at this time also sought to impose total surveillance over its people to make sure that they wouldn't be, or the criminals within it, in order to, that they wouldn't um, break ranks within that system and to encourage their re-education so they could be properly socialized for that society. And finally, the penal system and the possibility of punishment must be known among the entire social body in order to deter people from committing crimes. Now, these principles preceded prisons themselves. 
it wasn't as though they emerged with the prisons, but they were uh, they were sought after by penal theory and penal institutions before prisons themselves. Prisons were just kind of the perfect form of these logics all coming together in one, in one institution. So the other ways before prisons that these guiding principles were exercised would be like through um, tainting someone's name, like mentioned in the last episode, like punishing them as an, like an eye for an eye. If they steal something, they would maybe have their hand uh, removed. They would be forced into forced labor and so on. All of these other types of punishment belong to and adhered to, in some sense, these four guiding uh, principles of penality. It's just that they weren't quite as perfect as the prison. Now, in opposition to these punishments, the prison is different in that it is not, in Foucault's words, a collective system like infamy. It's not graduated in its nature like uh, a, an eye for an eye. That is, it doesn't elevate as uh, a crime elevates or diminishes as a crime diminishes. And it is not reforming like forced labor claims to reform people. The prison is instead an abstract, monotonous, rigid, punitive system that was introduced in reality and discourse. So the prison homogenizes uh, criminals. So you would have a thief next to a murderer in prison instead of the thief experiencing one specified form of punishment and the murderer experiencing another specified form of punishment. And what this did was to help create this class of homogenous criminals or to homogenize the category of criminality to better control that identity as a group so they could be better managed and better dealt with. Now we're going to elaborate on the following point much more as the chapters go on here, but it's important to note that prisons sought to take away people's time of their lives without killing them. It just sought to take them away from their liberties and their life. And Foucault suggests that its emphasis on time and duration away from society, away from one's own life, things you enjoy doing, people you love, and so on. It was a way by which emerging ideas about penality mirrored emerging logics of capitalist production, where you'd go into a factory and give up your time and labor for someone else's benefit. The prison mirrored that in treating time as a function of one's crime or of one's punishment. So in Foucault's words, he says that just as a wage is given for a period of labor, a period of liberty is taken as a price of an infraction. So this more broadly corresponds, and this is something we'll talk about more as we go on, this corresponds to the way that society more broadly, French society and European society specifically, started to repress and control time. And this made it possible for wage earning to happen and for capitalist production to really occur. And it also made it possible to better control people, to better situate them within their lives, better mandate their lives and control, segment those lives, and to treat prisoners in a homogenous way. Your crime no matter what you do, you're going to be put in the same place. The only difference is how much time you're going to spend in this same place, which is just like, like any claim that prisons stop people from recommitting crimes is absurd by that fact alone in that you aren't given specialized treatment uh, or like worked with in accordance with whatever crime you've committed. It's just a matter of how much time you spend there and time like what, what is that going to cure? Not to, not to just uh, submit to the logic of rehabilitation, but if we, I guess if we do submit to the claims of what prisons are supposed to do, I don't see how anyone can believe that that will work. That will somehow make society better. But in any case. So he says that the prison form and the wage form 
are both functions of time, specifically the repression, the new kinds of repression of time that comes about in accordance with the new logics of control and domination. And that puts us here into chapter five. So the prison form and the wage form occur when there is introduced a certain quantity of time into a system of equivalences, where you have wage uh, against so much time of a labor of labor conducted and prison against this or that offense, like prison time against this or that offense. So time and the repression of time is what unites these two forms of control through wage labor and through prison time. So against what a Marxist might say, where they might say that, yes, of course, this is because the economy started to be organized in such a way, and we saw its organizational habits spill over into other arenas of life. Foucault identifies that these logics were emerging before capitalist production was emerging, and they were being applied across the entire social body, even those that weren't yet affected or touched by capitalism. People were internalizing this new form of the repression of time. And he says that instead, it happened according to what he calls a new moral measure, a way by which to gauge one's virtue in accordance with their relationship with time, how much time they were willing to give to, uh, to labor more generally, not just capitalist labor, how much time they're going to give to their uh, society, to themselves, and so on. And to combat any charge or any criticism that this prison form could actually be seen much earlier before prisons, like in religious convents, Foucault says that the difference was that these convents weren't about keeping someone out free from the outside in order to protect the outside. It was in a, instead a way by which to protect someone from the outside where the outside world social life was seen as harnessing as harnessing as containing all of these impurities, whereas the religious person had to be in a pure space away from those impurities. So society wasn't being protected from them, they were being protected from society. So to jump back to this idea about moral measure and, and how a new kind of repression of time motivated the formation of capitalist ex exploitation and the prison form, Foucault turns to the Quakers in the United States and then in Europe and, and elsewhere to identify the almost the exact moment in which this control of time took place. And it would then be extended to penality and then to prisons. So he traces the, this moment to the Quakers within early, the early period of the United States. Now, the Quakers were a religious denomination of Protestants, more or less, who believed that one's relationship to God didn't need to be mediated through like a church or through a priest, but that the light of God could be found in each individual person. And for the Quakers, this would come about through demonstrating oneself through hard work, through care, giving, and so on. You didn't need to go to church, profess your sins or anything like that to actually have a good relationship with God. You just had to be an upstanding citizen. Now, in England, the Quakers weren't a fan of the way that the English penal system was imposing harsher and harsher forms of penality against its citizens, like the death penalty. The Quakers didn't like that. And when they settled in the United States, the early, the early colonies, they didn't want to replicate that same system. They wanted one that was not quite as harsh. Now, from our perspective, what I will say is that the Quakers proposed also a very harsh system, just without the death penalty or relying so much on the death penalty. So in newly independent Pennsylvania, what we saw was the emergence of a new punitive armory that was comprised of the prison, mutilations, flogging, and public works. So prison within the system would become dominant, which still sucks. Like it's not like prisons are a good thing, but in their minds and their eyes, it was better than being put to death. So the Quakers' religious influence made it so that they could easily associate criminals 
Very much like the physiocrats presented in the last episode, they could align criminals with being fundamentally evil and therefore a threat to the social body. Now, unlike Catholics, the Quakers didn't need pageantry to foster a connection with God and to guarantee salvation. You know, they, like I said, they could just do it through hard work, through care, through uh, taking care of oneself. And this required that any one person, in order to foster a proper relationship with God, had to renounce their passions, their desires. They had to repress all of that stuff and just focus on being a good, hardworking citizen. Now, this meant being prepared to renounce the body, your body, and your desires, your drives, and your immediate mental, emotional, intellectual wants, and instead to keep your eye on the prize, that is, God's love and God's grace. Now, this was the motif of early Pennsylvania prisons who, that were run by the Quakers. And in Foucault's words, he writes that the mind must become empty and pure again so that the inner divine light shines out anew. And it would then be a way to purify the body away from or to protect it from the influence, evil influence of your desires and drives. Now, what would be the best way to do that? to remove somebody from the impurities of society entirely. So the prison, at least the logic of the prison at this time, was to take somebody away from all of these temptations so that they would only be allowed to look inward. If you're locked up in a dungeon cell and you have nothing to do, the idea would be that you would be introspective. You would look in on yourself, into yourself, and you'd question your life and what actually matters to you, and you'd find God. This was the driving factor behind the Quakers' prisons, or run by them, in the early colonies. And there's really no coincidence that the term penitentiary comes from the uh, French word uh, penitencier, which refers, has a connection to uh, penance, which is like the priests giving penance to, to somebody. And this was really the first joining of penal theory and Christian doctrine. Christianity needed the prison to insert itself in the penal process. The prison's logic, logics mirrored and, and really permitted, welcomed those of the church. So we can see here a sort of trinity emerge, where you have prisons, the church, and citizens. And it is, it is expected from Christian doctrine that citizens are to be pure uh, individuals free from their own passions and drives that are fostered within an impure society. So, in order to correct that, within our Trinity framework here of prisons, church, citizen, you'd send the citizen to the prison, where they could then foster that relationship with God. So, because the prison is ostensibly here a site for spiritual growth and development, it needs surveillance in order to make sure that it's always working. And this is the human surveillance, surveillance conducted by humans. But the implication is already that you're always under God's surveillance. And if you fail to do right in the eyes of God, you're going to be punished. Both in the, on the world, you're going to be sent to prison. And in the afterlife, you're going to be sent to hell or whatever they imagined happened. So they were put under pretty strict surveillance. They were monitored, they were recorded. And these records didn't just get deleted immediately after or burned immediately after they were taken. What actually happened was that they were, they were kept. And researchers, scientists, uh, psychologists were like, wow, this is a treasure trove of information about people's lives within prisons. And so see, here we see emerge a new way of understanding people from these prison records so that they could be better understood. And this opened up a new possibility to grapple with people as objects of knowledge. Their, any, any of their attributes, their actions, their daily routines can be broken down and understood in order to better prepare for how to deal with future criminals to deal with future deviants and in any one that doesn't fit the social mold. So there's really no coincidence that hospitals would emerge around the same time. Hospitals managed and surveyed 
what in Foucault's words, he says that they uh, surveyed the anatomical physiological science of man while the prison managed and surveyed the soul and the person's character. So we see a kind of dual surveillance going on here. The hospital surveys the body to make sure your body is correct. Whereas the prison surveys the soul to make sure you are attaining salvation through your isolation in this place. Now, there's such an interesting thing that occurs here as well that Foucault identifies. And this is just one of, I mean, this is one of the things I love about Foucault is that he provides all of this historical insight, which in itself is super valuable. But then he, he really digs deep into the implications of these historical phenomena. So he says here about the prison and its connection to Christianity, he says that because Christianity in the eyes of all of these people extends back forever, like it goes back to the creation of the universe, what this did was help naturalize the prison so that the prison just became associated with the proper one primary way to deal with criminality because it's connected with Christianity. Because Christianity and because Christianity goes all the way back to the start of the universe, well, I, not the, you know what I mean, like God and the idea of God's virtue uh, or being virtuous in the eyes of God extends all the way back to the first humans. What this means or what this does is it naturalizes the prison and allows for little possibility to criticize it or to identify the other historical moments and efforts that uh, helped it emerge so that it's you know it's not as though god willed prisons into existence this was done by humans at a certain point in history for certain reasons but if you're hearing this and you're like wait a second i thought we were talking about france and england what, what are you talking about here with the united states are you saying that the prisons emerged in the united states now well no but we can't ignore that influence, and this is what we're going to get into in the next chapter with chapter 6. So it's important to note that despite some beliefs that the prison existed for a long time, way before the early 18th century, uh, it was really perfected at this point. So there were, like I said, like you could find all throughout history examples of prison-like structures, like dungeons, where people would just be put you know, put away in like a... A, a, a tall spire or big tower and locked away forever like rapunzel for example it goes way back well i guess i guess rapunzel isn't that far back it's like the 17th century or the around that so it's around the anyways you get what i mean dungeons other kinds of prison like things go way back but its generality as a type of punishment was new and this emerged in that 17th 18th century period and it really comes into fruition and it comes to dominate with the re real rise of this Christian logic of penance and salvation, which ironically is happening around the time that science, you know, quote unquote science is starting to really take off as well. It was almost like an effort to um, make sure that Christianity, to make sure that religion would remain in the face of science. It's like a last ditch effort, last ditch you know, Christianity is still very much alive today, but it was an effort to almost like incarcerate people who would not abide by it. And so there were the witch hunts as well. There was the prosecution of scientists for being, you know, for breaking the word of God or whatever. So the prison here is a microcosm of, of broader societal transformations that can be attributed to Christianity in part, attributed to capitalist logics in part, attributed to a broader repression of time in part, attributed to um, the imposition of this idea of moral virtue upon people's hard work and criminals uh, challenging that. It can be attributed to the association of labor with fundamental value. And all of these things contribute in some part. And this is why French and English prisons weren't just motivated by the Quakers in the United States, as I hinted at at the end of the last chapter. There were all of these other factors here, but what the Quakers were doing did have some effect, like all of these other things. So here he's going to consider both France and England on their own, starting with England. So he says that in England, there were groups 
who shared the similar values of the Quakers. That is supervision, control, and punishment. Essentially, there were Quakers and Methodists in, the, in this context who were concerned with maintaining order and morality. Now, other religious societies who lobbied against uh, licentiousness, that is laziness, idleness, they lobbied against these things. They lobbied against deviance, criminality. They weren't all religious. Some of them were influenced by belief in virtue, like Aristotle was. So if anyone's not familiar with Aristotle, <laughs> he wrote a book once called the Nicomachean Ethics, or a text called the Nicomachean Ethics, in which he advocates for a thing called virtue, and for humans to best to live their best lives, they have to embrace and strive for the golden mean, uh, which is not to submit in any one direction too too hard, like to try to get too rich or to be too poor or to be too um, to experience too much pleasure or to experience too much work. You have to to be properly virtuous. You have to find that middle ground, the balance of all things. So there were religious influences in England like in the United States with the Quakers. So there were the Methodists and the Quakers themselves still in England. But also there were other groups that were had a vested interest in this prison structure and for prosecuting people uh, for, breaking, for breaking the law, for breaking the social contract and the laws that were put in place. So there were paramilitary self-defense groups, for example, they were put in charge to oppose the 18th century uprisings by the peasant and working classes who also had an interest in making sure that people weren't going to revolt. And one way to do that would be to send them to prison. Where in prison, they weren't going to be able to organize very well and uh, orchestrate a revolt. There were also uh, guards who were hired to protect private property, who formed almost a class of their own and wanted to people not to present a threat to their lives and to the property that they protected. Now in England, what united these different groups was a desire to protect the, the accumulation and concentration of wealth into the hands of a few. So this new bourgeois class was starting to employ all of these guards, all of these paramilitary groups to protect themselves from peasant uprisings. So there was this capitalist influence here to motivate the extension of prisons across the social body and to further control people. And because the new kinds of criminality that were emerging were really hard to keep track of and to, and to really handle because of large swaths of people coming into cities, there's, there's tons more people, tons more reasons for people to commit crimes because of impoverishment, lack of housing, lack of food, and so on. Lawmakers had to rely upon smarter ways to deal with these potential threats. So like we said just a few moments ago, the prison was a homogenous way to deal with, the, with criminality. And we see that play out here. The state didn't have the means to really deal with each individual criminal on its own. It needed a homogenous, easy way to deal with them. And that's not by exiling them, because where are they going to go? They're just going to come right back. As per the capitalist logics at the time, it wanted to encourage easy mobility between people. So where are you going to send them to? I mean, if you send them on a ship to uh, one of your colonies in the United States, they're still going to commit those crimes there. And then, like, how is this problem being solved? What, what are they going to do then? Send them back? Because, you know, that society is just going to exile them. And what, what use is that to send them back? Of course, colonies were used, like, to send people just to, like, islands. Like, I don't know, Australia? Is that a myth? I don't know. This is something I've never looked up. But in any case it proved to not to be the most effective way to actually deal with these people. Instead, they just set up these prisons, they just threw up some walls and just shoved people in them. And like, okay, we, now we're dealing with this this way now. And they, what are they going to do? But by having such an, a homogenous system to deal with criminality meant that the possible spectrum of criminality could be extended to include even more forms of deviance. Because what, we, what they wanted was to um, maximize and optimize production and anything that posed a threat to that, like we said in the last episode, being lazy, not having kids, refusing to have kids and contributing to the workforce, of not doing your job as well. These, these could all be things that could send you to prison. And then it became not so much a matter of waiting for someone to in, 
kind of do this crime, but to start to associate other markers with these crimes. And so here emerges the broader category of deviancy, like associating some identity markers with being a potential criminal, therefore being put under more stringent surveillance. And then if it so happens that you happen to break one of these newly imposed laws, like being lazy, then you'll be sent to prison. Whereas if you didn't have these identity markers in the first place, let's take, say, like tattoos, which is often something that is used as a way to justify people's exclusion from certain jobs, very much to this day, like the expectation is, is that if you have tattoos, you have to cover them up for a job interview, right? Any boomer will tell you this. This is just something that's they just expect. If you do, don't have any of these totally arbitrary uh, identity markers, you won't be put under such surveillance. And so you do have that opportunity to slack off a little more than someone else. And this is this relates to the um, sociological terms. I think it's called the broken window uh, idea. And the idea is that in communities that experience and have experienced historical disenfranchisement through uh, removing industry, like from urban areas that often affect urban black communities in the United States and in Canada, what happens is that, uh, of course, things go bad. And when things go bad, there's increased police presence. And increased police presence means there's going to be more uh, arrests happening. More arrests happening means more police presence. And so we see a cycle begin to emerge here when this doesn't actually have to do at all with the prevalence of criminality. And my example here is if police were actually interested in arresting criminals, they would park their little cars, their cute little cars next to golf courses and catch people drinking and driving as they leave golf courses, all likely white people in most contexts and arresting them just doing that. But you don't see that happen because these people are not marked by that society. And so the expectation is then that crime is not occurring over there. It's occurring in another place. And this is how these cycles begin and are very difficult to stop. So as we mentioned earlier in England, the idea was that, like, of course, they just wanted people to act properly. And they're like, you know, we actually don't want to send people to prison. We don't want to be prosecuting anyone. So just act right and we won't have to do it. We just do it reluctantly because you just can't seem to act properly enough for us. So in this case, penality becomes associated with morality, facilitating its widespread adoption. So these people are kind of tacitly, which is to say secretly, or um, I don't know what a good synonym is to tacitly, like to do it um, sneakily without, without making it deliberate. Anyways, they can tacitly normalize the idea of prisons because they are the way to treat people who are immoral. And who doesn't want to be immoral? To be, a, to be moral is a good thing. Society wants that. So the state in these contexts is called upon by the bourgeois and by this call for virtue, order, morality to deploy figures like police to the lower classes, to those unsavory populations who might step out of line. So the state calls upon various other actors like police in these contexts to enforce the linkage between morality and penality, to convince the people that it is because they are immoral that they then have to be punished. And this can be done very broadly instead of being specialized, specific to just a few people like previously, before there was a broad surveillance machine that could capture so many different people at once. So the penitentiary would be the extension of this coercive factor of convincing people that they are being immoral and need to be punished. It is universal. It's all present. And so the penitentiary steps in when coercion isn't enough and punishment needs to be used. So the prison uh, is for those who have evaded coercion, who haven't been convinced, who haven't been properly swayed. And so they have to then be punished by being sent away to a prison where they will ostensibly be introspective, they will reflect on themselves and come out as proper citizens, which of course doesn't happen. Now, we're going to get into France in the next chapter, so in the next episode, so stay tuned for that, because there were other guiding 
influences there to give you a sneak peek. Whereas I was just outlining the ways in which English penality uh, motivated the formation of prisons there attached to bourgeois influence. In France, we're going to see that there was still a stronger attachment to the state and state power, not so much capitalist power. That was still a part of it. It's not as though they're totally separate, but we can see a stronger influence by the state there. And we'll talk about that in the next episode. But for now, he wants to illustrate this point about punishing people by considering the uh, abortion debates that had occurred in 20th century France. And to be honest, this point feels, it feels undeveloped and a little out of place, but in any case, he says it, so I'm conveying it to you, where he says that in one of the elections leading up, one of the um, debates leading up to the elections, elected officials were called upon to give their opinions about abortion, to which they said that they, it doesn't matter because they're not in power. And so there's nothing they could do about it. And Foucault says like that this is such a mysterious thing because all that is saying is that they are actually helpless at the whims of the state and the status quo. So without establishing their perspective on the matter beforehand, the people aren't actually given the power to choose who to vote for. So they don't know if they're voting for someone who's going to impose stricter laws against abortion or to make it legal, safe, uh, easily accessible, and so on. And so this just reveals the way by which systems and status quos keep themselves going. We just normalize the state's judgment and the current, uh, the, cur the current way that things are run. And yeah, that'll put us into chapter seven. I'll stop there. If there's anything I got wrong, anything excluded, I'd love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, let me know. Do you buy it? Do you feel yourself at the whim of capitalist production? Do you feel yourself structured according to the repression of time that we've described here? Or do you feel yourself needing to abide by a certain moral character or being virtuous in a certain way? Love to know what you think. Um, if you listen to a podcast, this on a podcast platform, you can leave a review. I'd love to read them. And yeah, on that note, take care.